Welcome to the 2021 Green for Sea Forum. Uh, in these next uh, couple of days, we have a full agenda to discuss. Day one is uh, dedicated to the challenges we are facing as an industry, as we have to move towards greener shipping, let's say a more sustainable future for our industry. Today, we'll be discussing about green shipping challenges, best practices, air emissions, ballast, water management, scrubbers, ship recycling, and uh, ESG. And uh, the following day is dedicated to uh, fuel options. Tomorrow, we'll be discussing about LNG as a fuel, LPG as a fuel, ammonia, methanol, hydrogen, wind. And last but not least, we're going to discuss the atomic option. So welcome to, to, the, to the first panel, the opening panel, let's say, of the, of the forum. In this panel, we'll be discussing about the green shipping challenges. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> uh, let's say, a heated discussion over the, the past one and a half year about the IMO 2020, the challenges that the industry is facing. Sulfur cap marketed the beginning of the decade in which the, our industry's environmental agenda is overwhelmed with more regulations along with the decarbonization challenge. So that's, we have the IMO 2030 and 2040 and 2050 ahead of us. Uh, there's an ongoing discussion of uh, where the industry should settle, let's say. So as we heading towards a greener industry, the challenges are many and the industry stakeholders need to be aware of the available options. Now, in this panel, we would like to discuss what are the key green shipping challenges up to 2030 has our industry succeeded in enhancing the environmental performance? What needs to change to accelerate the industry's path towards a greener future? So in order to have the discussion, we have assembled a panel of, of experts. Let me briefly introduce them to you. Uh, we have Nicolas Maxis, a senior vice president, maritime administration and regulatory affairs for the international registries, the managers of the Marshall Island uh, flag. We have uh, Dr. William Moore, Bill is the Global Loss Prevention Director for the American Club. Uh, Sotiris Raptis, who is the Director of Maritime Safety and Environment for EXA, the European Community Ship Owners Association. Uh, Mark Smith, who is a Loss Prevention Executive working with the North of England PNI Club. And last but not least, we have Kostadinos Karavasilis, Senior Loss Prevention Executive of the UK PNI Club, based here in Athens. So, <clears throat> gentlemen, welcome to our discussion. Um, so as we have, let's say, the first order of order business <clears throat> out of our agenda, I would like to ask you to start with the presentations. And I would like to ask Nicholas uh, to start presenting his thoughts, let's say, by sharing his screen. Nicholas. Um, of course, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to join a very distinguished panel of, of speakers that you've put together um, on a subject, as you mentioned, which continues to capture a considerable degree of attention and concern. Um, of course, meeting the decarbonization targets set by the IMO on reducing GHG emissions will be an unprecedented challenge for the industry. Um, this is going to require mul a multitude of efforts and initiatives to be successful due to the scale and global nature of the issues at hand. So it's crucial, in my opinion, at least, that a cohesive regulatory approach needs to be taken to provide an effective and balanced response to this matter and to keep the shipping industry on its path towards a greener future. So to begin, when discussing what needs to be done, you know, to improve the industry's environmental performance, I think it's also helpful to take a step and, and look back at where we are today as well. And uh, remember that there already is an effective international regulatory framework that's applicable to all ships engaged uh, in international voyages, which has been in place for a number of decades. The successes of the MARPOL Convention in dealing with a range of environmental challenges associated with shipping can be clearly measured with some of the most notable achievements related to reducing air pollution from ships. While there are a number of drivers behind the initiatives bringing us to the decarbonization agenda, I think there's three critical milestones that are worth mentioning here. Official discussions in air pollution began in the 80s, which ultimately led to the adoption of a new sixth annex to the MARPOL Convention in 1997. This annex, or Annex 6, sets standards for the control of air pollution for ships. The annex quickly, by international treaty standards, reached uh, thresholds for entry into force on the 19th of May 2005, 
And uh, the 1997 protocol marks the starting point here because with the adoption of Annex 6, the IMO also agreed to consider what CO2 reduction strategies might be feasible in light of the relationship between CO2 and other atmospheric pollutants. It was on the basis um, on, of this agreement that policies related to the reduction of GHG emissions from ships were adopted by Assembly Resolution 96323. And from here, policies focused on three approaches, the, the technical measures, such as the EEDI, operational measures, as well as market-based measures to reduce GHG emissions. Of note, mandatory technical measures, um, which is the EEDI, have been instituted since 2011 with the inclusion of a dedicated chapter under MARPOL Annex 6 on energy efficiency regulations. This chapter has been further revised as part of the IMO roadmap for reducing a comprehensive strategy on reducing GHG emissions from ships and leads to the final piece of this puzzle. In 2018, IMO member states came to a landmark agreement and adopted a resolution setting forth its initial strategy on GHG emissions. The initial strategy reaffirms the IMO's commitment to addressing this issue and sets the levels of ambition for a pathway towards decarbonization of the industry this century. In this context, although the IMO is nearing the end of its timeline with regard to the roadmap, various streams of activity brought together are aimed to culminate in 2023, which will be the next significant milepost in this story. 2023 is going to be critical for a variety of reasons. It's not only the date by which short-term GHG measures developed under the strategy are to be finalized and effectively in place delivering reductions, but this is also when the revised IMO GHG strategy is envisioned to be adopted according to the roadmap. Presently, we'll be looking very closely at the next session of the MEPC, which was rescheduled to June this year due to COVID-19. The draft amendments to MARPOL, which established the EEXI and carbon intensity indicator frameworks, are expected to enter into force by 2023 if they're adopted in June and follow the tacit amendment procedures at the convention. Importantly, however, the next MEPC must also begin to initiate other work streams to keep its timetable to begin work and consider adjustments to the initial strategy. This revised strategy must not only include further measures and implementation schedules, but it's anticipated that there will also be pressures to strengthen the levels of ambition, which set the 2030 and 2050 decarbonization targets. With this in mind, as evidenced during recent development of the short-term GHG measures, the sulfur cap regulations, as was mentioned earlier, as well as other initiatives, um, any policy-based approach developed under a universal framework must follow a carefully balanced set of principles in order to be meaningful. And I think this is what gives the measures developed through the IMO its greatest benefit. Effectiveness, of course, is crucial and probably the most important in this regard. Regulations need to reconcile a desire for strong and robust enforcement provisions, which are intended to maintain a level playing field and avoid commercial distortions, while at the same time ensuring sufficient flexibility to be realistic and prevent any unintended consequences. Uh, we certainly saw this play out with respect to the IMO 2020 um, uh, developments. Any imbalance in this regard could risk causing a regulatory approach to fail, which nobody wants. Evidence-based decision-making also plays a crucial role in this regard and is one of the guiding principles of the initial strategy when considering measures for reducing GHG emissions. However, this should not necessarily limit or delay action on critical outputs either. Another aspect to consider is the feasibility of a standard. If the balance is off in this regard, regulations could perversely stifle innovation or the sector could be placed in an untenable situation where compliance cannot be realistically assured. There should also be a clear understanding of the intent of a regulatory measure in terms of its effect on the industry and recognition of early movers. This is obviously related to the chosen regulatory approach, whether it be a, a, pres a prescriptive measure or uh, a goal-based approach, and that would certainly guide how this is set up. And lastly, something that must always be kept in mind is the human element. And, and as I like to say, always ensuring that uh, appropriate balance between environmental benefit and safety to ship and crew is always maintained in any, any activity. Um, now, normally in developing these kinds of regulations, you know, we can see uh, things such as emergency provisions introduced into the regulations to, to sort of allow for that balance. But it's also important to kind of keep that balance in mind from the very beginning as well. Now, one additional point of caution, perhaps, that I'd like to bring up in the context of this panel is that 
you know, through the IMO, any type of consensus-based decision-making can be a time-consuming process. And for that reason, external pressures um, are, are something that we should be careful about. Um, these types of pressures shouldn't necessarily lead to the threat of regional initiatives due to impatience or frustration with the IMO's process. But public perception can also be a powerful driver for change. In any case, the benefits of working within universal frameworks really should not be understated and shouldn't be bypassed, especially when the objective is achieving long-term progress on global issues. Incorporating environmental performance goals into a universal treaty regime, such as the MARPOL Convention, is crucial for international shipping. Advantages that are, you know, some of the advantages are that policymakers can build upon existing implementation mechanisms, such as survey certification provisions of an existing standard, um, or also provide for enforcement by implementation under the no more favorable treatment principles, which is um, present in, in every IMO instrument. This is the non-discriminatory, excuse me, non-discriminatory principle that's applied uh, regardless of flag. And this also provides the authority of flag states to exercise sanctioning when violations are discovered. And then lastly, of course, in closing, the important thing to remember is that when considering decarbonization agenda, it's important not to lose sight of advances made in other areas. So in other words, a step forward in one area shouldn't necessarily lead to steps backwards in others. Um, so with that, I know our time is limited. I'll, I'll end it there and turn it over back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, I would like to uh, revisit some of your last comments about the regional initiatives and the public perception, because one of one of the things I would like to discuss is how, as an industry, we should make, let's say, for for a smoother cooperation, maybe smoother transition of these, you know, because there are some interests, especially in the EU, I would like to say, the, the same applies in US for maybe other reasons, environmental wise, uh, that they would like to push forward an agenda. So I would like to discuss how this may be realized. And uh, I would like to thank you for your presentation and, and let's let's proceed with uh, Mark. Mark, let's hear your uh, initial uh, thoughts uh, on the on the green shipping challenges uh, we are facing as an industry. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and first of all, um, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening and, and thank you, Nick, for opening up with a with a very interesting regulatory overview. Um, I, I'm talking from north of England, Pain Eye Club and and you know, one of our interests here is to try and guide ship, ship owners and, and everybody in the industry about the changes ahead and the green sea shipping challenges ahead that we're talking about today. So without further ado, I'll move throughout the presentation and we'll touch on a few points here. So Let's look at the shorter term challenges, 2030, the challenges ahead and what we have just around the corner. This has been touched on previously there, but we're just gonna touch on the relevant points. It's short term, so we, we need to consider this shortly and this is what the message we're trying to get out to our ship owners now that, we're, uh, that are insured and entered with North. So EXI challenges ahead, what type of vessel do you have and when was it built that's very important and it has it has a huge bearing as we move forward to this next period past 2023 whether it's a bulk carrier container vessel or whatever or a different type of vessel than that so that's very important also what are the trading patterns for this vessel and for how long will the vessel be trading in these areas What's the charter party duration? That's another question that we all consider here. So it's all worth considering these points. Is power limitation an option to achieve the required targets? And if you do limit the power, what about the service speed and how is that gonna impact your performance and relationship with the charters? Which improvement measure is best suited to your vessel? And you know what can you use if power limitation is not an option? And there's many different options there. We'll not go into all the details, but whether it's working on the efficiencies of the hull or the engine equipment or various different system carbon capture. There's many different technologies out there. The one thing we wanna highlight here though, is that it's not just like the period we've seen with 2020, where there's quite a few options which are limited. This opens up a massive field of options, and we're going to see lots of debates over which options are the most suitable in the future. 
the cost of modifications and the time required, that's essential here. You know, it's essential for ship owners and you have to consider these options as you move forward. Also, we need to consider the carbon intensity indicator. Every ship owner and everybody involved in the supply chain wants to avoid the inferior carbon intensity rating of DRE. And they need to consider external factors such as weather conditions need to be considered. It's going to be harder to achieve certain targets if the weather conditions your vessel is sailing in is predominantly impacted by this. And then also there's been talk in the industry about the surge of power needed for safety of navigation, diversions, etc. And how is this accounted for? So these are all points that need to be considered and are equally important in this decision process. Forward thinking now, we need to look at operational efficiency, that's for sure. Whichever type of vessel you're trading and the larger vessels in particular, you know, you have to consider charterer involvement and port optimization. Just in time shipping is very important and perhaps that's easier to have an influence on container vessels, but it's in a very important topic and a topic we're going to see more and more of raised throughout this future. Voyage optimization is another area where we're going to see definite movement and definite improvement, and that's required to, to reach the required targets. Smart vessels and remote monitoring, we're sure that's something we're going to see more and more of as a holistic approach comes forward with a lot of the big carriers already using these systems to monitor the vessels on a global basis and discuss with the masters, chief engineers and ship managers how they can improve this. Weather routing, we're going to see even more of that taking and having a bigger and bigger impact. And then research and development, not only through the IMO, but in different areas of the industry. And everybody working together is a point we really want to bring forward here. We want to see as many parties working together as possible to try and make this all happen in an efficient way. We're only going to learn from everybody else's lessons. And that's the best way we can adapt to this as we move forward. Now, fuels of the future, this is a topic we could talk all day about. And throughout the course of the, the next few days, I believe there'll be more detail on the particular fuels. So we're not going to go into the granular detail here, but what we will look at is what's important to consider for the fuels of the future as we move towards 2030 and beyond. And one of the first points is the infrastructure and bunkering is critical. You know, we've already seen Northern Europe and Norway, for example, need lead the way in their infrastructure and bunkering. How quickly is this infrastructure and bunkering going to be applied globally? That's the question. And that has a huge bearing on many different factors. Because as we point out next, bespoke vessel design and trade specific are a part of this because you can only trade the vessel where the suitable infrastructure and bunkering is there. So we really need to look at this and consider this if you're building a vessel, especially for the next 25 years, you need to consider how and where the vessel is going to trade. And then more importantly, very important here, we have to raise the point of safety. How are all these new projects designed? And to make sure the safety is happening correctly, we've obviously got the radically landscape, which we looked at before, but we need to consider crew training, expertise and qualifications, and educating everybody to make sure everybody's on the same wavelength. As we said before, it's not going to be like it has been in 2020, where there's only a couple of different options here. We're really going to see the, the expertise spread because there's so many different new and evolving areas we're going to see over the horizon. Then we need to consider quality control and specifications of fuels as we move into the ne next period. And contamination, we all want to avoid contamination because of the, the consequences it may have. All of these, if the fuel's not managed correctly or the fuel's not sourced correctly, could lead to problems which lead to breakdowns, propulsion loss and possibly delays to cargo. And to do this, the regulatory landscape is essential and the system's approval so that all the systems used on the vessels are to design requirements. And then just another point to consider is the relevant charter party clauses between ship owners and charterers. Another point we want to raise here, which we always like to talk about, is the well-to-wake aspect. You know, 
it, at present, we understand the tank to wake is the focus, but as we move forward, we would like to see well to wake as a whole, the holistic approach to make sure that fuel is sustainably sourced and it makes a way right through the supply chain. Sometimes we use the analogy of driving an electric car, which looks very inefficient at when we're using it at the end. But if we consider the whole life cycle and the battery production, etc., then there's many different aspects to this. Then we just move on as we discussed briefly there into the charter party clauses and what needs to be dis discussed on this. Does the charter party span 2023 and beyond? Is the ship owner and charter relations, negotiations and weather routing, these are all points to consider. And who bears the costs and the risks? The owners and the charters need to come to some alignment on this. Then we consider docking clauses, out of service, energy saving devices, the express right to dock, emergency docking and deviations. In addition to sea cargo charter clauses, carbon tax emission trading and data collection clauses and slow steaming in accordance with charter's orders. I'd just like to bring that to a close there. Thank you for your time. If you'd like any more information on any of this, please feel free to look at our website. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, let's hear from Costadinos. Uh, Costadinos, <clears throat> let's hear your thoughts. On, on where we, we stand as an industry and what are the key challenges ahead of us? Yes, uh, Justin, let me... First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I would like also to thank uh, uh, both uh, Nick and Mark for their presentations. Uh, actually, Mark touched upon a bit on issues that I would like to talk, but uh, anyway, we can, one can fulfill the other, I would say. So I am sharing now my screen. So... <laughs> Emissions from international shipping. Uh, everybody knows that international shipping is a growing source of greenhouse gas emissions. About 850 million tons of CO2 of carbon dioxide per year are emitted from our ships. Uh, if we were in a live audience, I would like to make a, a, po a poll. I mean, if it was a seminar, not a webinar, in any case, just today is only two to four percent of all greenhouse green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But if if the industry does nothing, uh, we will reach fifty or two hundred and fifty percent by two thousand and fifty. So what actually the natural the, the greenhouse gases are consisting of? They are consist of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and minerals. Now the, the industry has already started since. Uh, mid-2000 to deal with uh, SOX and uh, NOx emissions and uh, you know the NOx emissions are are, um, are based on the type of engine and uh, of engine of the vessel of the vessel's engine and uh, how the engine is performing so major engine manufacturers have dealt with it a bit and also since 2020 we have the sulfur cup and we are dealing with SOX but uh, we have forgotten, not forgotten, we left for this for the last uh, the carbon emissions. And I'm not talking about only carbon dioxide, but also methane, anything that actually contains uh, uh, carbon. So, as uh, Mark and Nick mentioned earlier, uh, we have now started with EDI and we, with EXI uh, indexes and in order to control, to better control uh, carbon emissions. So I will not go through much uh, to that. Uh, newer vessels uh, being built uh, from 2013 to 2014 onwards are better, let's say, equipped than and designed uh, than the previous ones. And unfortunately, uh, nowadays, uh, ship owners with vessels built, let's say, in 2010, a vessel that is considered to be young, maybe after its uh, second special survey, still younger vessel, so they are they're facing with the problems on what to do and how to deal with these indexes in order to make sure that uh, their vessels remain um, in, in, a, in a position uh, to travel uh, throughout the world. So a very brief uh, CO2 reduction map. You will see now that we are in 2020, 2021, 
2021 actually, and we are entering by 2025 to EDI phase three, and then uh, our goal for 2030 is the CO2 uh, reduction by 40%. And also not to forget uh, the various reporting systems, uh, both by European Union and IMO that have been already set and uh, are going to be implemented actually very, very uh, soon. So again, this is a more focused uh, situation. Now, uh, Mark touched upon a, a bit on the matter about uh, the proposed amendments to be done in order for older vessels uh, to meet uh, the, the indexes. So that's different technologies as far as the engine room is concerned, propeller is concerned, deck equipment, deck equipment is concerned, hull is concerned. And all these systems uh, are being actually now designed and tested uh, on, on board vessels. Some of them are more successful than the others. So again, uh, we have also operational measures apart from designing measures and retrofitting measures. And uh, then a vessel, as was mentioned before, uh, will be rated A, B, C, D, or E. And this one uh, will be evaluated. So you may have your vessel being A this year and next year to be C, D, or E. And uh, there are many factors, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, that uh, can actually uh, do, uh, can affect this. So the role of alternate fuel, you know, uh, nowadays we all talk about alternate fuel and uh, their impact. As you can see from this graph, if we do not do anything and stay on the alternate fuel, whatever fuel you decide, you will note that the impact will not be that much. So we need a combination of, uh, of things in order to be able to meet uh, IMO's uh, ambitions and IMO's targets by 2030 and 2050 respectively. So uh, let's talk very, very uh, briefly about alternate fuels. We have LNG, LPG, biodiesel, methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, fuel cell and battery. I will say that uh, LNG, LPG, biodiesel, methanol, ammonia, all of them, they do leave a carbon footprint because they derive from uh, fossil uh, from fossil fuels. So uh, this is what again uh, Mark said from the well to the wake and not focusing only from the tank to wake. So this is something that the industry has to take into account. And of course, uh, there are different parameters to be taken into account prior to uh, a ship owner um, uh, choosing uh, what kind of alternate fuel uh, he will use for his vessel such as energy density, technology, fuel flexibility, flammability, toxicity, emissions, availability, etc. And of course, the type of the vessel, uh, because let's say nowadays for the LNG, uh, we do have bunkering stations in certain parts of the world, whereas we don't have in other parts of the world. So if we have a liner, let's say, between these ports, yes, it can work with that. But if the vessel is a tramp, let's say, or uh, finds it herself somewhere in the world that no LNG facilities are there, it is very difficult uh, uh, for bunkering. And this does not apply only to LNG, but applies to uh, all uh, alternate fuel surrounds. So very, very briefly, that was my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Kostas. Thank you very much. Uh, let's hear from uh, Sotiris. Uh, the focus of my presentation will be on the regulatory uh, developments, mainly on the European side. Um, the, 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 the ambition of the European Commission to come up with a proposal to, in, to include shipping into the European Emissions Trading Scheme and um, a parallel initiative to introduce a fuel standard on ships the so-called Fuel EU Maritime Initiative. But I'm going to start with, uh, with the EU ETS. We know that we are facing a lot of challenges and we have a very strong preference for international approach. Shipping is an international industry and this is what we're trying to explain um, to the EU policymakers. The Commission and the EU has come up with a very ambitious target for 2030 and 2050. 
um, they have announced that they want to achieve um, emissions reductions by 55% by 2030 and for Europe to become the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. Implementing this strategy, they have announced uh, a number of different um, legislative initiatives that will come out quite soon. We're expecting that um, the EU ETS proposal will come out uh, in June and the fuel EU uh, maritime proposal anytime soon. In this regard, we developed our position, the framework conditions for a European market-based measure aiming to make sure that the international negotiations at IMO level are not undermined, are not derailed, and that all segments of our sector are provided with um, the flexibility needed. And trying to come up with evidence-based evidence -based, um, uh, proposals, we also commissioned a study within the International Chamber of Shipping. Um, it's a highly complex and diversified market, shipping market, with a great number of ship types and contractual relationships and operators. And we, would, we need not to forget that the backbone of our industry is small and medium-sized enterprises. We need a level playing field all across the world. That's why we need to support the IMO process. And this is why we need the EU to invest um, uh, their capital in supporting the IMO negotiations. Otherwise, we're, we're facing a high risk of political tension with third countries and trade disputes. And even within Europe, we're facing also a high risk of model shift, um, a shift to road uh, with, uh, with more CO2 emissions and more road congestion. Shipping is by far the most efficient form of commercial transport and um, Apparently, uh, the initiatives taken uh, and the initiative taken at the regulatory level and the initiative taken by the industry itself have delivered to, to some extent. Emissions are globally down by 7% and there was also an improvement of about 30% in carbon intensity, despite a 40% increase in maritime trade. One of the, the main messages we were trying to convey to the policymakers is that um, fuels, future fuels, low or zero carbon fuels do not exist or are not commercially available at that moment. And if the Europeans go for an EU ETS as designed for other sectors or land-based sectors, this will not be, won't be fit for purpose. It will result in a huge administrative burden, especially for SMEs. Another important element is uh, the use of the revenues where the money of the UETS um, will go in the end. And we need also, if the Europeans come up with a measure, and we know that they will do it the next few months, with, um, with a measure that will be scalable and compatible with uh, whatever the IMO come up with in the future. Um, we need also to avoid penalizing uh, maritime transport operating uh, under special weather conditions. Um, and any measures should take into account a 2008 emissions as a baseline year. One of, uh, and I'm going straight to the fund, if I, if, I, if I should sum up quickly, our main proposal is the establishment of a fund under uh, a European MBM. First, to minimize the administrative burden for the companies, to allow companies to participate in the system through the fund. The fund will purchase allowances for CO2 emissions of its uh, member companies in an open ETS system, but it won't be the companies themselves. What we want to see is a price stabilizer. The fund will use as, uh, as, as a carbon price the price of the ETS of the previous year, the average price of the ETS of the previous year. That provides certainty, price certainty for the companies. And the revenues should be reinvested in the energy transition of the sector. Currently, 
80% of the ETS revenues are reinvested in the carbon tradition of land-based industries. They are invested in so-called feed-in tariffs, the electricity, renewable electricity we use in our households is financially supported by the ETS revenues. This is how the price gap is bridged between conventional fuels and low and zero carbon fuels. And we want to see the same for the shipping sector. Well, I mean, we're not asking for a, um, special, a special treatment of the sector. And by using this money, um, R&D projects could be financed, new propulsion technologies, but importantly, the price gap between conventional and low carbon and low and zero carbon fuels. On the scope of, uh, of a new system, uh, our, um, our um, uh, preference is that, uh, it, that it is limited compared to the full EU MRV system to avoid political tension with the third countries. And um, we also want to see a phase in periods during which only part of the emissions are covered. This will give more time for the industry to adjust, more time to the regulators to identify potential uh, errors in the design of the scheme. And that effectively means that uh, the companies will be responsible for not, uh, not for 100% of their emissions, they will be responsible for a part of their emissions and the system will cover uh, gradually up to 100% over time. Um, going to the second main, uh, to the second major legislative uh, proposal, the Fuel EU Maritime, this is about introducing a fuel standard as a requirement for ships, not for the fuel suppliers. And this risks failing to deliver uh, its environmental objectives. It, it risks failing to deliver emissions reductions. It will be really challenging to enforce. Um, the Commission aims to introduce a fuel standard on ships and effectively aims to regulate fuel suppliers all across the world. And we don't think that this is realistic. A global approach should be the cornerstone of the EU's policies. But anyway, if the Commission wants to introduce a fuel standard, that should be introduced as a requirement on the fuel supplier within the EU market. The counter argument of the Commission is that um, a system like this will be easy um, to circumvent. Ships can um, refuel outside the EU. On the other hand, the overall objective of introducing a carbon pricing mechanism is to use these revenues to um, to promote the uptake of new fuels. This is what happened in the power sector the last 20 years. They used this money to bridge the gap between renewables and coal. And if they are serious about introducing new fuels in the market, about supporting the uptake of new fuels in the market, they should use this money to financially support uh, the uptake of uh, low and zero carbon fuels, first of all, in the European market. So along with our proposal to establish a fund under, the MR, uh, under the, an, an MBM, the Commission in the EU should introduce also more incentives and more requirements for the fuel suppliers. For instance, sub-targets for new fuels under the Renewable Energy Directive and a higher multiplier for marine fuels, renewable fuels, under the Renewable Energy Directive. Thank you, Sotiris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's, hear, uh, let's hear from Bill to conclude with this round of uh, presentations. Bill, let's hear your thoughts. Please share your screen. Some interesting presentations are heard to date, and we have some very interesting challenges when it comes to the future of marine fuels, of course. Um, you know, we at the American Club, we, you know, I, I would, I listened to both uh, Kostas and, and Mark's presentations in particular um, uh, closely as they relate to how they're addressing with their, with their ship owner members as PNI clubs. 
the issue of the future of marine fuels and, and the like and these challenges. So um, first I'd like to just say, you know, that there are so many different factors that we consider. We consider the different fuels, we consider the, the safety, uh, the risks and the safeties uh, components, the uh, loss prevention perspectives uh, and the like. And basically it's still a big puzzle that we all try to figure out the different components too. But um, from our perspective, uh, what we do and as we look at marine technologies as they evolve, both from a safety and a green technology uh, perspective. The PI clubs, you know, I do hear from ship owners and people in the industry from time to time. Well, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And I say the industry as a whole and PI clubs and marine insurers in general have been very, very supportive of anything that makes ships safer and greener, of course. Um, but we also are very aware that the, such risks bring on new, te uh, new technologies always bring on new risks. And we try to take those into consideration. And instead of focusing a lot of our attention on uh, what's what, I mean, of course, there's classification, there are manufacturers, there are uh, those technology developers who are all out there addressing uh, these particular risks in their own faction, our own in their own perspective as they try to bring these new technologies online for our industry. Um, but we tend to look at it, we try to, uh, I put as what we call P&I lenses in front of it, and also a bit of hull machinery too, because there can be a bit of uh, uh, spillover from one to the other. We try to look at all these things from a from a P&I perspective. I mean, how will this impact P&I? Everything when we look at cyber cybersecurity, green fuels, all these things, Everybody asks, well, how will you deal with this? How will we do with that? And we try to do try to maintain that that uh, focus, saying, listen, if it has a risk that impacts a PI related uh, issue or liability, we will likely cover it. Uh, um, and of course, there are all kinds of uh, nuances with that uh, in other areas, but but still. So basically, what we try to do is look at uh, our risk from a uh, from a liability perspective, uh, how it will impact PI. Okay, because there are, we, we're trying, that's what we do for our members. And, and of course, there's significant amount of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, overlap between uh, uh, these issues. So, what I'd like to do is uh, just, you know, what if we look at these various risks, I mean, things that have, some of these are elements that are being currently addressed like ballast water management, ship recycling, low sulfur fuels. And then we have others in the future, which are LNG, LPG, ammonia, methanol, hydrogen, these uh, new fuels, okay? So just to give you some perspective from some of the things that we've looked at uh, already versus those things we're looking at for the future, I will not address the concept of, or the issue of ship recycling, but I will uh, touch on the rest of these other elements that are noted here. Um, ballast water management. Uh, when the ballast water, and a lot of issues with regard to uh, that can impact um, p &I as well as hauling machinery, ship strength and stability. Uh, you can have the ship have all kinds of different problems. It can have corrosion related problems. We have malfunctioning and underperformance of ballast water management systems that can potentially spill over into p &I or uh, FDND charter party uh, related matters as some of the things that, that Mark had mentioned. And uh, Kosas, I think um, I briefly mentioned also potential fines and penalties, uh, and these types of things. There are PNI components that we see with the ballast water management. Uh, this is still an open issue. Uh, we have not seen an overwhelming uh, related uh, uh, set of concerns to date. But prior to the implementation, or as we're going through with this implementation, we had quite a lot of dialogue with our members saying, these are the things that you need to take into consideration uh, for, uh, uh, for compliance with these and have an environmental impact upon how we move forward. Then we also looked at low sulfur fuels, machinery systems and scrubbers. Uh, still a lot of debate, still a lot of discussion about these particular machinery systems and scrubber technology, uh, of course, must be well-maintained. 
I think the industry over the last year, despite the COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic, have adapted. This this was the big, if you all recall, a year ago before the pandemic hit, this was a big thing we were talking about before COVID-19. And then it became uh, basically the the the, uh, the mouse that roared eventually that, you know, that it, it sort of took a backseat to everything COVID related, but still, um, there are things that we still are looking into with it. Uh, there are concerns that we still have. Again, they are not as dramatic as getting shipping back up in line as uh, uh, given the pandemic. But we also look at, at this in a bit of detail. Uh, we put together a compendium, which we thought that was uh, quite helpful. Other clubs have also put together excellent guidance. There's nothing that was earth shattering compared to what other clubs did, but we fit in our little niches. And I think that all the things that the clubs put together actually uh, gave a good uh, perspective with everyone putting in different little parts that were of interest. Um, but we also added a series of uh, best practice animations uh, that we thought that would be helpful. Uh, that was independent of the actual uh, uh, sulfur uh, sulfur cap. But we we think that such things are are uh, good to focus on for the seafarer for the seafarers to really uh, 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 pay attention to, and are things that uh, bring it down to that deck plate level. All these things can be found on our website, you know, as noted. But um, just I'm just not going to go through a lot of detail of these, but, but we have been talking to uh, classification societies, in particular ABS, uh, with regard to these various uh, fuels and where, where we actually are now and what the things that they're actually looking into as they're dealing with uh, ship technologies and builders and manufacturers. Uh, methanol, for example, has toxi uh, toxicity and exposure issues with skin asphyxiation uh, and other uh, safety related uh, concerns. Also with regard to fire, corrosiveness on the systems. So these new fuels, uh, again, something that that uh, we try to look at from, we discuss with the, with the industry, we discuss with uh, the classification societies where relevant. And we look at these risks and say, hey, is this something that we have a particular concern that we really need to look at? Uh, most of these are just uh, mostly chemical related issues that we don't in have any particular concern above and beyond what we've what we've seen today. Uh, same with ammonia, uh, toxicity and exposure, corrosive flammability issue, uh, significant flammability range, uh, fire exposure, something that we all uh, PNI clubs as well as hull mach machinery as well as all in the industry have particular concern for. Um, Hydrogen, as we all know, is quite uh, uh, combustive. Uh, it also has uh, cryogenic and uh, or pressurized uh, tank concerns from a safety perspective. Uh, also um, burns off at low temperatures and it has a particular uh, impact upon metals and the like. So we also look at the same problems with LNG that's been around. LPG, that's been a bit of an issue. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. Uh, but to, uh, to sum up, what I'd like to just say is that basically clubs engage members, manufacturer classification all the time. We talk to everybody. We try to stay in the loop about what's happening. And we try to, again, look at these matters as they relate to a P&I or a whole machinery perspective. So then we can give guidance to ship owners from, from that uh, angle. Uh, we also develop loss prevention uh, initiatives and guidance. All of us do on the P&I uh, side and assist members in addressing whatever claims matters they have. Thanks for your attention and appreciate the time. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Bill. Um, now, um, I have an, a number of questions. I would like to start with our, let's say, the representatives of the, of the PNI clubs. We have a number of uh, challenges associated with, with loss prevention. We had IMO 2020, and I would like to ask specifically if you had any issues with the IMO 2020 transition, and spe more specifically, if you had any issues with the NOx Tier 3. Uh, I think maybe one of you touched upon briefly on, on the NOx Tier 3 issue. NOx Tier 3 is being something like an invisible requirement for the industry for a number of reasons, uh, but it is applicable for the North American makeup for the new builds after the 1st of January of 2016, 
So it is an existing requirement. And I would like to ask specifically if you had any issues with either NOx DA3 or IMO 2020. It seems that we had a seamless transition, but let's hear from start from uh, from Mark. Mark, do you have any any issues with with your uh, members? The with Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we we've seen a, a huge, um, we've seen many different claims and many different problems. Uh, the the nature of the fuel is paraffinic, so part of the problem we've seen is sometimes the actual management and use of the fuel by crews on board the vessel. Um, as the characteristics of the fuel are very different to what they're used to, the paraffinic content and the viscosity of the fuels have been very widely ranging. In some cases, we've heard of viscosities being down to single figures, you know, nine, eight, nine centistokes. So to then get the right temperature to inject that into the engine is causing some problems. We also see, we didn't see the problems with cat fines that we expected but we've seen we've seen a lot of problems with as we say fuel oil management and using the correct cylinder oil for the sulfur sulfur content of the fuel you know as you lower the sulfur content of the fuel then you require a lower tbn cylinder oil to counteract the sulfuric components from the combustion process and in some cases the incorrect grades have been used and the cylinder oil feed rate may not have been um, used correctly. That's something that we've we found across the industry. But it's also quite hard for the ship owners and crews to manage these type of fuels. It's been quite a transitional period for them. And we've seen problems with liner wear. Probably that's one of the biggest things we've seen. As we said, that could be down to the cylinder oil issue. We've also seen problems with the wax appearance and wax disappearance temperatures. You know, historically, we used to... Um, we used to carry the fuels at around 10 degrees C above pore point, but now we're seeing the pore points very low and the wax appearance temperature and wax disappearance temperatures, you know, at a different range to what they used to be. So then you're having to heat the fuels up. And in some cases, we don't think the fuels are being heated up enough. And then you've got the consideration of the low flash points as well in conjunction with this. So balancing all of this has been quite a, a tricky act for everybody. And, and that's what I'd like to say on that. Yeah, okay. Uh, Costas, uh, any any feedback from your end with regards to IMO 2020 or NOx tier 3? Yes, uh, we've seen many claims uh, just as Mark uh, said before of this nature. Uh, I would say also associated claims to that when uh, uh, crew heated the fuel oil and the tanks, the tanks were adjacent to the cargo holds and we had uh, uh, several cases of damaged cargo due to that. But uh, I, I would say that uh, the industry uh, had uh, very good reflex and, uh, reflexes and actually uh, dealt with the, the issue uh, better than expected. And yes, we've seen claims, yes, we've seen, um, uh, let's say, complaints, etc. But... Uh, uh, we saw that uh, the industry continued and, uh, and now that the year has already passed and I would say the transition period is over, uh, things are getting smoother. As far as UKP and I club, I'm talking now, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, I have an idea what's going on globally and I think that uh, we do not see so many, many problems. We expected things to be worse. As far as uh, tier 3 is concerned, I have not come across any peculiar strains, let's say, uh, myself. Yeah, I think it was more or less, uh, uh, Bill in his, uh, in his presentation highlighted, we had a heated discussion, let's say a, a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, but it seems that everything had worked extremely, you know, seamless and we had this transition and it was not a big deal. This, this is our understanding. Bill, your thoughts, you are based in the US, you should have some, some feedback I just have two brief thoughts. I, I think that, that Mark and Gus has hit the nails on the head, but I, I do agree that, you know, it's been a, a bit of hit and miss with regard to the fuel oil management issue. We've heard some some concerns about that from some of our ship owners. I thought Mark gave a very good detailed, detailed uh, hit the details, you know, points on the head uh, quite, quite uh, well. Um, but I also, but we also have had similar, in general, we've had similar experience to what Gus has mentioned. We haven't seen too many problems, and we we also have gotten the impression from the dialogue with our ship owners that you know, despite 
some of the problems that they have. They've adapted well, you know, given given the challenges, and uh, they they've done that uh, quite smoothly, better than we thought it would be more difficult. We thought there would be more problems than there would be, and there haven't been from the American club perspective either. Just as Costa has mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let Let's go to Nick. Nick, any any feedback from your end? on the issue of the IMO 2020 transition or NOx tier 3 specifically? Do you have any any problems with, with your, uh, let's say, owners? Well, I think a lot of our observations uh, coincide with what we've, what we've just heard, that the transition has been um, relatively smooth and, and it was uh, successful. I, I think the number of incidences of, of, of serious nonconformity, and of course, we're looking at this as a flag administration from a compliance perspective, these uh, notifications of noncompliance have been relatively low given the the number of ships that are trading and um and and all of the transactions that are taking place in this regard um but but of course i mean the thing i guess to remember to highlight here is that the the, the risks are still there and this is what the the point of the discussions the last year or two leading into the transition were all about is the fact that um you know making sure that there is a focus on certain aspects and certain issues that may relate to to fuel quality and and so on and so forth and that's why it's important to also keep an eye on this and not um necessarily sort of dismiss it or rest on our laurels that this was really a, a minor issue or that that it was a, a boy cried wolf type situation um, as far as Knox Tier 3 as well, um, you know, again, this is sort of a very specific requirement um, and, and it's sort of difficult to say at this point at least um, whether there's any significant trends. But um, I think if anything, there's maybe some, um, uh, there, there might be some issues or not issues, but confusion with the new record keeping requirements. But apart from that, the, the actual um, implementation of it has likewise been um, smooth. Yeah. Okay. Now, we have another topic as we discussed and you both, you Nick and uh, Sotiri touched upon your presentations. We have diverging priorities and different objectives. We have the EU aiming for a carbon neutral continent by 2050. That's the idea of the EU. And we have shipping aiming, targeting, let's say 50% emissions reduction based on the 2008 emissions. So that's very, that's very different. It could be like black and white. And within this context, we have to, we in shipping have to work with our friends uh, and allies in, in, in the EU. And I would like to start with Sotiris on this. Sotiris, you mentioned, you highlighted the EXA, let's say idea, the EXA proposal to put in that sense. I assume that EXA will work as an intermediary between, uh, let's say the, the ship owners and the, I don't know who will be monitoring from the EU side, this uh, MBM that th they are, will be proposing. Um, my question is, uh, how do you think that this will work in, in, in real life? What do you expect in terms of transition? Because we have the IMO being a little bit, let's say, slow on taking decisions. The EU is coming very strong forward willing to, let's say, enforce this immediately or promptly as possible. So how, how do you think in terms of transition, what do you think it will happen? It, it's an interesting question. First of all, I wouldn't call it black and white. Um, it, said it could be, it could be black and white, something like that. I mean, the initial IMO strategy, um, I mean, the objective is to reduce emissions at least by 50% by 2050. And this is a clear target without mm -hmm. offsetting. The EU is aiming to reduce emissions to, to become carbon neutral, which implies offsetting to achieve the target by 2050. And that doesn't mean necessarily that all sectors will go um, at the same speed. There are sectors much easier to decarbonize. There are sectors much more difficult to decarbonize, like shipping and aviation. So there, there are going to be different targets under the EU overall targets. Um, but for sure, we uh, are watching the EU to go ahead um, and we want to see um, an alignment of any measures taken at EU level. I think that we have an opportunity to explain to the EU policymakers the special characteristics of the industry and what they could introduce so that any measures could be consistent and scalable in the future uh, with uh, whatever the IMO comes up. That's why we proposed a fund 
um, a fund that resembles the idea of a levy. It's not a levy, of course, but it gives price certainty. It can work as a price stabilizer. This is what we want to see. And it's an open question. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm optimistic. And I think that if we explain the situation to the policymakers, we're going to make it. I, I understand that. But the point is, uh, we are in a discussion within shipping, within our industry, over the, I would say, over the, the last 10 years of would it be a, a levy? Would it be something like an NBM? Would it be something like an ETS? We are discussing, we have the EU coming forward with something like a concrete proposal with specific, uh, you know, bits and pieces. And we, we try to, let's say, minimize the impact of such a, let's say, significant decision to, to our industry. Uh, Nick, uh, let us hear your thoughts on how, how could we make this transition from where we are to, today to, to where we will be heading in the near future uh, seamless. The, the way that IMO 2020 maybe worked. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to hear um, Sotiris's views on this because um, quite honestly, I think um, Sotiris, uh, of, of course, and, and, and industry voices in general play an absolutely critical role in, in ensuring that efforts are aligned. Now, it, it's something we take for granted at the IMO. The IMO itself is a technical organization and it regulates a very specific sector of the industry. So um, um, ship owners and industry groups and associations of, of various degrees are, are very clearly represented in those discussions. They take a very active role in the, not only in the, the policy making decisions, but the development of the actual regulatory frameworks as well, along with the member states. But I think it's the same voice of the industry, the same level of advocacy for what shipping brings to communities what it brings to global economies that's necessary as well at the more localized levels because it's it's again maintaining this this balance of priorities among the policymakers to ensure that measures to address a global issue are appropriately aligned in that sense okay uh, any any thoughts from the other three <clears throat> let's say members of this panel uh, bill mark or uh, costas on this well, I, I, I'm not I, sure I, you have it. No, I, I just a very quick uh, thing. Yeah. I believe yeah. that the decarbonization is more complex than the previous challenges uh, the industry faced. And unfortunately, uh, we didn't have the time as an industry to think of it. You know, we didn't have time. I mean, they came back in 2000, let's say, 9, 10, 11, and they said, okay, we have 20 years. But uh, unfortunately, policymakers do not understand thoroughly how the maritime industry works and the investments, you know, um, having spoken to certain uh, ship owners, you know, they, they invest, let's say, 20, 30 millions and suddenly they found out that their vessel is not good to travel, you know, and they will have problem, you know, to see the, their investment income uh, uh, being reduced or vanished. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, we as an industry, we need to push harder the policy makers to understand uh, what our industry is and what actually does it mean to fight our industry. Because we saw now, you know, Suez Canal was closed for six days and the global economy suffered a lot. Imagine now to have 2,000 vessels not be able, you know, to, to go around and uh, carry goods, what will happen. So this is food for thought for our bodies and for our industry to uh, persuade, to try to persuade policymakers to not to sympathize us or to, you know, to, to have more relaxed laws, but to think more of how they're going to implement this. I, I understand that, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a Herculean, let's say, Herculean uh, task to try and persuade them. Sotiris is based in Brussels for a number of years. He has worked for a number of organizations over there. And he fully understands, you know, the complexity of the decision making and the, you know, the different priorities and different objectives of each of the stakeholders, you know, involved in this regulatory, you know, making process. The same more or less applies to other sectors of the world. I mean, we have other issues with the environment, such as, for example, the scrubbers and the, you know, what we have over the sea and the, the ban of the open loop scrubbers and so on and so forth. 
And we've seen many instances where local legislation may be enforced. You know, in spite of what we discuss over here, what is discussed in the IMO, again, and so on and so forth. So I would like to ask you, as we have, we will be out of time. I would like to ask you to give me your views on, let's say, we discussed a number of issues. I think the most pressing one that we will not discuss here is the CAPEX and the OPEX issues, especially of, of all these, you know, implications out of what we discussed here. But that's not the panel to discuss the CAPEX and the OPEX issues. I would like to ask you to highlight from your perspective which area you think it should be, let's say, improved. Which area would like to see that the performance might have, let's say, room for improvement, to put in that sense. We have room for improvement to cooperate. I understand that with the policy makers, fully understand that. So there is highlighted some, some certain, let's say, uh, thoughts and highlighted a, a proposal of how to make it easier for us to adopt. So Nick said in his initial statement that we have issues. We have issues because there are local interests who would like to take this a little bit further. So in your, in your view, which of these areas that we discuss, which of these areas of environmental performance you expect from our industry to perform better uh, in, in the future? Nick, where do you see room for improvement maybe? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I, I think uh, one of the things that's understood is that due to the sort of the scope and the complexity of the issue that there's, there's always room for improvement in, in all sorts of different areas. Um, but uh, I, I think the main thing is um, just to take it at a different level, maybe, rather than looking at a specific uh, aspect of performance, I think where the improvement is needed is, is, is sort of in advocacy and, and also in the image of the industry and making sure that um, the improvements that have been made, all the steps and all of the, the, the advances that have been made in improving that environmental performance and bringing the industry along this pathway towards a greener future are, are known and emphasized and so that the you know at least the policymakers and at the uh, various level from public perception all the way on down it's understood that the shipping industry is doing its part and is also recognizing and trying to play a role in um, making for a better future so I think it's that advocacy aspect of it that um, um, certainly uh, can continue to um, require some effort. <clears throat> may, may I ask specifically, because it's something that we, we we tend to, let's say, refer to, how practically, how should the industry should improve its, let's say, image and, uh, you know, its, its voice to those who are not necessarily industry insiders, in your view, if you can highlight, let's say, the, the well, that, role of Yeah, that, that's a good question. And, and unfortunately, I don't think I... I I have an answer to that. I mean, it's certainly going to take someone much smarter than myself to, to be able to figure that one out. Um, the, the IMO, of course, is a good example. The, the IMO actually is a very good advocate of the industry and the work that member states have taken on, on sort of improving the performance of, of the sector. Um, but, but I guess there's also other developments that are taking place, which are also outside of the context of this panel of it as well, such as things like, like ESG and, and, and other matters, which obviously are, are, have been developed on the basis of, of that perception. So, um, so, so clearly, I guess you could look to, to the IMO, you could look to some of these other, other initiatives as, as a way forward in that regard, I would yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't want to touch upon, you know, the recent incident of the ever given. Yes, Bill, I'm coming to you. Because Costa has mentioned in his, his earlier comments, Bill, your thoughts. Um, so uh, my my thoughts are on this advocacy issue, which I agree with Nick one hundred percent, and I think everyone here does agree. But you know, I've been I've been making the the comment for you know for decades, basically stating when one of the the issues with our industry is we're still not as well. I don't want to say known, respected, and but. We, we only get on the news when something like the Ever Given occurs or Exxon Valdez or a passenger ship is on fire. Um, we don't, we get our CNN time. And what happens is that particularly when you're looking at environmental advocacy, ad advocacy groups that are, that are, let's just say, not necessarily um, friendly with us, 
When they complain, they go to New York Times, they go to the LA Times, the London Times. When we want to make an issue, we go to IMO, we go to Lloyd's List, we go to Trade Winds. We, we don't, we don't seem, there seems to be a disconnect with regard to what I think the general public, you know, uh, actually knows about our, our industry as a whole. So uh, I, I would have to, uh, basically agree with the point that Nick just made. I think that's the biggest thing, advocacy for our industry, because we also have a lot of sub-industries, you know, that are all not virtually not talking to each other either, uh, who don't normally, I don't mean that in a negative way, I just mean they just run in different circles and different domains. So there's not an overall, uh, let's say, advocacy of the industry. No. Yeah. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with what everybody else has, has said here so far. Um, the only thing I would say is that it, it's it's quite a complex path that we've got ahead of us, you know, and it's it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of change, a lot of joint up thinking, a lot of research, and a lot of development. Um, we saw. Let's look back at 2020, for example. We saw some of the big ship owners who who could stagger half their fleet, and half their fleet would have scrubbers, and half wouldn't have scrubbers. You know, exhaust gas cleaning system. And you found that nobody could really predict the price spread. You know that we we've seen recently, and that is going to be accelerated even more and emphasised even more as we come through this next period because we're going to have all these carbon taxing and trading systems in the background. So really, it's very hard for a ship owner at this moment in time to predict the next 20 years. It's going to be much harder than, than we could possibly imagine because we don't know what sort of outside assistance is going to be there, you know, what sort of financial uh, burdens or financial incentives for that matter are there to encourage the different forms of ships. So unfortunately, if you're about to build a vessel now, for the next 25 years, it's probably not the best time. I'd probably want to be building one in the next five or 10 years and, and capture that point correctly. But there's just so many unknowns here. Um, and I think that's what we need to see as an industry. We need to see the guidance. It's a bit chicken and egg here, you know. We need to see the guidance and the clarity on which fuels are going to make it to the forefront. And then we need to start building the ships focused on that. that that's my opinion on that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But um, just just a quick comment on what you said. If I go back, let's say, and I can recall what happened, let's say, 25 years ago, in 1995, uh, owners back then. Now we know what happened in the in the in the in the next 25 years. So a lot of things happened and a lot of things changed. Meaning, back in let's say 25 years ago, uh, the owners were not aware that the industry will change. So in that sense, they were not properly prepared because they didn't know anything. So they were in absolute ignorance, let's say, to put in a sense. Today, I think we are in much better shape and position because we have better collaboration, you know, more discussions. They are aware of what will happen in the future. So that didn't happen in the past. Just as I said, just a quick comment in contrast to what is happening today. And I agree with what you said and what happened in the past. Costas, your thoughts on, on where we, we go as an industry and if we should, let's say, accelerate our performance in a specific, let's say, area? Well, uh, I would say that the, the, our industry has to show more extroversion and show to the public what we are doing and, you know, what we are offering to them. And as soon as people understand uh, how the industry works and uh, what actually impact does the industry have on their lives, they will understand and they will lean on our uh, problems uh, uh, easier. You know, our industry is a misunderstood industry. And as uh, who said, I think William said that, that uh, people only learn about uh, shipping industry only when something happens. Look at the aviation industry, which is more polluter, is, is a bigger polluter than the shipping industry. Still, people love aviation. Uh, whereas they do not like us, let's say, as much as they do with them. So we need to do that. And of course, we need uh, also, you know, to, to persuade the policymakers not to make hasty decisions. Because yes, we know what the future is, but uh, we know it at the very last moment. So we, we need to know beforehand in order to be able to prepare and adopt and deliver. 
and be in line with what the public wants. And I mean, to save the planet, which is, this is uh, the aim, but we need first to know what's going on. We are not scientists, we are not environmentalists. So we need to know all this before in order to be able uh, to act accordingly. Yeah, just some food for thought again on the comments you made. For all of us, I mean, and for our viewers as well, BIMCO produced uh, some months ago a, an excellent video of what shipping is and, and so on and so forth. But there was an ongoing discussion, even in our own industry, that this video has not gained, let's say, uh, air time to put in that sense, in, in mainstream media, outside shipping. And as we use social media, this video has more something, I think, of less than half a million views or something like that. Imagine there are a million people uh, involved in shipping. Even, even we as an industry, and that's, that's not a, an accusation or anything, this is just food for thought. Even we as an industry, we haven't decided how to, to get this message across outside shipping. And that's for all of us, that, that's food for thought. So Tiris, uh, being last on this one, uh, give, us, give us your thoughts on where we should be, let's say, standing as an industry and where should be heading in the, in the near future. Your thoughts. I, I, I don't think honestly that any, um, any reporting on shipping is um, a negative one. For instance, the unfortunate incident in the Suez Canal, I think that many people realize the role shipping is playing um, in connecting um, people in, in, in the modern world. Everybody realized it. Everybody realized how shipping, um, how important shipping is. As you said, many previous speakers um, emphasized uh, the role of advocacy. I would probably say engagement. We need early engagement. We need to understand the, um, um, the regulatory and political environment to engage with the policymakers, to come up with evidence-based recommendations. Evidence is key, is critical in this discussion. Um, and honestly, we need also to emphasize the role of, uh, of IMO. I mean, Okay, some people would say that IMO is slow. Yeah, but IMO is what we have at international level. Climate crisis is an international crisis. It's not a European crisis. It's not an American crisis. And we need to trust multilateralism. We need to put a lot of capital in this process. And on the other hand, we know that the EU will come up with certain measures. We need also early engagement there. And I have to say that we were one of, uh, of, of the few uh, industry stakeholders engaged so early in this process and coming up with certain arguments and certain proposals. Yeah. Okay, I would like to uh, thank you all very much for taking the time to participate in the panel. I want to thank all our viewers and uh, <clears throat> We'll be in touch. Thank you very much.